So then uh, I think the next basic uh, idea of the MOOC and how to organize all the discussions uh, and presentations was to make a distinction between two forms of co-creation. One is co-creation by invitation and one is co-creation in everyday life. And these were the kind of key concepts that we more or less developed ourselves uh, because we have been confronted with so many uh, different forms. We, we saw some similarities uh, whenever uh, people were asked to do something uh, as a co-creator. So they were invited by companies or by governments uh, or by their neighbors or the local energy uh, corporation to just uh, start thinking about how to improve the energy system. And we just kind of um, made a distinction with uh, this formal, kind of organized forms of co-creation on the one hand, and the kind of informal, uh, non-organized forms of co-creation, and we call that co-creation in everyday life. And the idea behind that was that here people have to, they are very aware of co-creation happening because you are in a living lab, you are invited and you travel and you participate in the setting and you know that you are there for a reason. So this is the formal one that's always very conscious. It's very, you are aware of that it's happening. And here you're just doing your everyday life. You're just living your life as you do it uh, on a routine base. And it's more or less taken for granted that you go by bus instead of car or bike. It's taken for granted that you shop in a supermarket and not in a fresh market or an alternative food shop. So these kind of, for you, they are kind of taken for granted decisions, doings. Uh, and, but on, we have shown that even if you make this everyday life decisions, you are always co-creating certain set social technical system, be it the food system or the energy system or the water system. So now we're going to discuss how useful it was in the end to make this distinction between formal and informal um, by invitation and everyday life forms of co-creation. And I'm curious to hear what the panel thinks about that. So Ilse, could you uh, give an example of co-creation in everyday life um, when it comes to water? Well, I think we've seen in Kampala some very clear examples where people are really yeah, making the systems themselves or yeah, arranging their sanitation services or drinking water provision on their own or together with others um, in an informal way, you could say. But yeah, it's it's a necessity for them, and it, the system has to be there. So yeah, by lack of formal provision, people take action in their everyday life. Yeah. I think that's uh, what we found out in Kampala very much that yes, they are yeah. kind of uh, forced to do co-creation because they want to survive. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not that they have five alternatives and that they think, well, what, which one would be my preference? Mm -hmm. uh, just to, to make a distinction between having a choice in the first place uh, or sometimes you have an abundance of choices like we see in Amsterdam, for example, uh, that people are kind of uh, uh, considering different options for the same situation. Yeah. Um, yeah, to build a little bit upon that, uh, in terms of uh, energy, uh, can you give an example of um, co-creation in everyday life versus co-creation by invitation? Um, I think we've seen clear examples in the, in the videos. Uh, co-creation of an energy system uh, in everyday life, for example, could be consumers uh, buying their own solar panels in order to generate their own uh, green electricity. Um, Co-creation by innovation was clearly shown in the clips about the virtual power plant where citizens were invited by uh, energy providers um, to join an experiment and to test a new technological infrastructure. So they, these are clear differences. And um, maybe on an analytical note, making this distinction between co-creation in everyday life and by invitation, I think is, is very helpful uh, because especially the category of co-creation by uh, in everyday life um, broadens um, the view on co-creation. So it's, it's very valuable in that sense. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I also have my doubts uh, to include all forms of co-creation in everyday life because it um, broadens the concepts in such a way that indeed you could say that everything is yeah. co-creation. Yeah. Even if people simply go about their daily activities, they are co-creating. Yeah. But, but I think if you, um, if you indeed, uh, I agree, if you uh, would not consider the everyday life part, um, you would miss out 
a lot of what citizens are doing in their everyday lives uh, to make their cities more sustainable. Um, so if you only look at like the living lab uh, situation in, in the virtual power plant or uh, other types of uh, co-creation by invitation, um, then you don't see, for instance, that uh, citizens in Beijing who go back on their bikes again, that they are co-creating a whole mobility system. Um, so uh, by only looking at co-creation by invitation, you may maybe only look at very particular events, uh, small, relatively small initiatives, and not see uh, the broader city, uh, picture of what is happening in the city. I think um, we all recognize that uh, when you talk about co-creation, uh, originally, especially also in the literature, it's very much on co-production, on co-design, where you have a particular emphasis on new products or new systems and you want uh, people to have a feedback uh, when this is developed, that they are kind of included as co-creators in terms of giving feedback and improving the system. So. Um, but we recognize that for this topic, it would be uh, a limitation to only restrict yourself to that forms of co-design and co-construction. So this co-constructing of everyday life, uh, it broadens up the original concept of co-creation, but it has a danger of being too wide. That's what we all recognize. I think a way out could be that you say, well, look at what is being co-created in everyday life. It is sustainability transition. So then you kind of narrow down topic-wise because you talk about energy and waste and air quality. So that gives a kind of um, uh, more narrowing down of your, your topic. Yeah. Also, uh, just a small addition. Also in the design world, at least where I come from, you see that there's a, a shift going on for designing for co-creation and whether indeed for co-creation by invitation, one would say, inviting people to think about processes, but also inviting uh, designing for co-creation in everyday life. So providing certain infrastructures so people in their everyday life can co-create systems themselves or co-produce them. Yeah. So that's also there, yeah. the different, maybe different wording, the same, the same uh, distinctions are made. Yeah, I can see. So, so in this co-design uh, literature and tradition, uh, originally people were kind of in the laboratory and thinking with scientists about yeah. innovation. And then we build kind of uh, experimental homes and we want people to live in that the experimental homes and to report on that. And now we are thinking about co-creation of everyday life from an engineering or organized perspective. Yeah, and they call yeah. it infrastructuring. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so there is this kind of uh, development of the concepts in, in, in the literature as yeah. well. Yeah. So that about um, these two forms of uh, making a distinction between different forms of co-creation. Well, if we then uh, combine these discussions, so, um, and that's what we already prepared, of course. And then we end up uh, with a lot of question marks of how helpful these distinctions are. But um, this uh, schedule is a kind of a first theoretical lens, we could say, to just um, make categories in the multiple forms of co-creation that we have been uh, uh, seeing happening in the MOOC. So there were so many different forms of co-creation that there was this need to think about how can we make some more major distinctions among categories. So we have co-creation of city politics and here we have both the formal and the informal, the by invitation and the spontaneous one, and co-creation of social technical systems, again the formal, the organized ones, for example in living labs on improving the energy system and the informal ones, people just doing their everyday life and as a consequence co-creating certain food systems. Maybe um, this is a very abstract theoretical discussion we had so far. I think it would be relevant if we now just uh, go and pick one or two examples that have been discussed in the MOOC uh, and that we say, well, for these reasons, uh, I would say that it's an example of this one, or it's an example of that category. Uh, let's see what happens if we start to uh, come down from the theory to the more empirical examples. So who is willing to bring the first example? Well, if we look, for instance, uh, to air quality and we take Amsterdam, uh, we have seen a very clear example of a uh, social technical system that is uh, formal. 
So if we if citizens start to measure air quality themselves, this is clearly a, a formal social technical system. So it would belong to well, I can write it yes, down. Yes. So this is the example we have seen of of the Waag system. where it's about technology to be able to measure the air quality in your environment and of course there is then the interaction with politics to, to get some political pressure. So I think that's a very clear example. And it's very much about citizen science as well. Yeah, yeah we see similar things actually in the Water Week uh, with different apps, for example, where people can contribute uh, by measuring flooding or by uh, using the personal weather stations to contribute to rainfall measurements. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's Go similar. And it. and <laughs> yeah. So what would be the catchword there? Uh, so Waag Society was kind of what, what, what people will uh, recognize when they have seen the video clips. So what are the names in the water? Sector. I would uh, refer to the, to the weather app weather that app. we've seen. Yes. And also, uh, what was it called? Rain sensing? Yes, yes, indeed. Another yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, so, this is air quality and water. Um, I think you can look at uh, mobility to see an, uh, really another form of co creation, uh, co creation of politics. Uh, I will write it down. Um, so, uh, I hope it's clear for the viewers, but uh, it's a critical mass. And uh, that is um, that an event where uh, citizens are uh, prote uh, protesting in the streets with their bicycles, um, which makes it very uh, much a, a political affair. Uh, but also, it's in in more or less in an um, informal uh, way. It's it's not like you're invited by. Uh, politicians to co-create the policy of the mobility system or yeah. something like that. Yeah. So do we have an example of a formal uh, form of co-creation, so in terms of city politics? I can think of one. Um, it could be... Uh, of course people vote. <laughs> for the field of energy, it could be the case when uh, citizens are invited to uh, an evening where the uh, local government discusses the new energy policy for the city and they get to uh, co-decide on uh, which policies they uh, prefer. So, um, for example, uh, participating in um, city policy making. on energy. Yeah. I think um, when we uh, have some examples of Kampala, then there was this formal, this organized way of co-creating city politics was done by a, a series of focus groups where uh, women in slum areas was, were coming together and they were more or less uh, pressurizing local politics and municipal authorities to come up with better uh, sanitation infrastructure, for example. So that's also an example of, I would say, uh, it was organized not by the government but by uh, CBOs, so community-based organizations and NGOs, uh, and they really aimed at making a difference in, political, in a political way. Okay, so then the last one. <laughs> yeah, uh, Jotte, you will come up with the informal co-creation of social technical systems. <laughs> yes, well, of course. I mean, uh, in Vietnam, we saw in the previous clips that there is also was the formal uh, co-creation of social technical system by local SMEs invited uh, customers to join, I think. But you have a lot of informal co-creation as well by the citizens in Hanoi because they are dissatisfied with the current food system and they start growing their own food and yeah. urban farming yeah. that we also see here. Yeah. I'm stuck. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just write down urban farm, farming and of course we see that also in different 
places than only in Vietnam. Okay, um, so here we come up with some examples that um, have some differences among when you compare the different forms of co-creation. It's helpful to think about whether they are organized or not and whether they refer to the politics or the social technical systems. So this is not just a, a big theory, but it's just a helpful set of questions for yourself if you start analyzing forms of co-creation in your own city, that you make first steps in uh, uh, analytically distinction, uh, making distinction between these different categories. So I think it has, has shown to be hopeful in that respect. Yeah, thank you.